You mean you're start, gonna start pre-recorded version? <laughs> Let me see if I can, okay. Okay, uh, well, so um, we had, well, Natalie, thank you. So yes, uh, yes, and we're gonna have <laughs> the meeting in Baltimore and it's uh, the first time this meeting actually has an agenda and the activities involve more than darting in the bar. So that's quite an amazing uh, first uh, for this project. I think. Uh, so we had um, uh, excellent working group presentation last week. And I think, I don't know if we expressed our kind of feelings about that. Uh, I think it was, it was great. It's really nice to see that working groups framework is working very well. So what we wanted to do is we basically stole all the bullet points from working groups. That's why we make you make those slides. So it's you know, life easier. Uh, and I think all we really did is did some rearrangement of this. So this roadmap for, I don't know, maybe two years existed at this HackMG document. Um, after this meeting today, we're gonna put it on Hub. And so it will live on Hub and all the future editing will be happening as a part of that Hub page, because I think it's time to let community know what the roadmap is. So we're just gonna go through uh, some of the priorities by working groups. So I'll start with UI, then I think Bjorn will uh, continue with backend and, and, and so on. So for so starting with UI, I think for UI group, if you see this, it's basically uh, the same that is in your slides, just slightly rearranged. I think there's been enormous amount of uh, UI work in the past year, even you know, more than, and uh, it's, uh, well, I I use I use all you know I use EU and org for essentially on a daily basis, and I can tell that it's it's uh, it's it's a it's a pleasure to use. So uh, the way we wanted to rearrange these priorities is that I think obviously in order to achieve everything, starting with number two, we need to invest in underlying infrastructure, and you know UI group uh, has the list of things that that they want to do. The history is already very much reworked. It, it's very nice uh, to uh, work with. Um, I think uh, one of the historical problems with history from the beginning was that it's linear. But in fact, the analysis that we do are rarely linear. So I think we're getting to the point where graph view is becoming very, very, very close. And that's going to be a uh, major, uh, major development for people who who do complex analysis with uh, with, with Galaxy and with history in general. And that's so. In when I was making this, uh, when I was editing this list, I was trying to also make connections to other groups. And I think UI works very tightly with backend because you know these things are impossible without each other. So the graph view, uh, the new scroller for um, large histories, it's if you work with, um, with histories with a lot of data sets, with a lot of collections, it's also nice to be able to have some kind of a checkpoints in the history that you can quickly go to. Uh, another thing, I don't know if you guys in UI group thought about this a lot. <laughs> We still have this, uh, for obvious reasons, I guess, difference between uh, the individual data sets work uh, compared with collections. For example, um, if you look at the individual data set, you have this button which, which allows you to see uh, the inputs. So the data set which gave you that data set and also the subsequent what came out of this data set. It, uh, we need to start thinking about doing the similar things for collections because that's impossible for collections right now. Uh, but it just if you, if you look at the collection without actually going into collection to be able to know what created it and that what's, what was created out of it without diving deep in the data set. So this is kind of a general uh, making sure that collections behave somewhat like data sets in these kinds of situations. That's very, very important. And it's uh, in particular for, for debugging workflows, for example. 
So activity bar, I don't know how many have you've seen that. Uh, but that I think streamlines the uh, use of Galaxy very much. And this in combination, if we're gonna have notification framework would be uh, wonderful. Um, I think I, I, my personally, uh, for me, one of the uh, uh, kind of a key uses for notification framework would be to highlight new features. If we can, I guess if I understand the notification framework correctly, because notification framework will also be, you know, will also be able to give you things like, you know, your scratch history is about to expire and things like that. But do I understand this correctly? Is this something that would allow us also to, you know, these are new features here. Is that how it will, will that allow us to do this or it will be something else? Yeah, sure. I mean, anything the admins would want to send a notification about, you could say, like, here's, you should check out the workflow interface now or something like that. Because uh, still um, thinking about the problems that we have, the biggest problem is, as usual, we don't let people know enough what we have. There are all sorts of hidden features uh, that are amazing, just people don't know about them. So that's... So in terms of visualizations, uh, I brought the IGV on top because we need to have full featured genome browser finally. We have uh, what's uh, the, um, sorry, it escapes my memory, what's the, What's the name of the of the genome browser that we have there right now? Trackster. No, no, no. Trackster is, is long dead. Uh, I mean, the one, from, uh, the one from Berkeley. Um, JBrowse? Yes, JBrowse, yes. Uh, so we have that, but it's not, it kind of behaves in, in probably suboptimal way. So uh, the, so IGV.js would be, would be fantastic. Um, well, the, the 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 data set view kind of decluttering the actual, you know, the 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 data set view and allowing to do things from that tabbed interface in the middle pane. Uh, I don't know if do you guys in UI group do you have a discussion with backend about this new things how we would go about um, scratch history how to how to create one how we will be able to do history archival for example on .org once we finish uh, all this acrobatics with irods it will be able to archive histories and so on, but I don't know if we, do, is there a plan in UI group for the interface aspects of that? Um, we haven't discussed specifically the scratch history. Um, we did talk a bit about how the, actually, I actually don't remember if this happened in the UI group or the backend group since so many of us attend both, um, but there's a lot of communication there about the, the archival history and how that should work. Um, you know, we presented that we were, we're not going to have the full uh, freezing this this next cycle, but we'll work on it uh, down the road. Um, scratch histories in particular, I don't think we've discussed a good UX for, um, but we should. Yeah, I don't know if that's, yeah, we're, I guess we just need to come up with live. Uh, so perhaps we should talk one of the, uh, one of the next UI meetings about that. So in terms of UI simplification, this is something that came up uh, yesterday during our uh, PI call. <laughs> so the idea there is to um, enable in some cases, so in, in the cases of analysis for which we have good workflows. So I think this relies on a lot of infrastructure, which workflow the tool group will also be uh, doing to perhaps think about how we can uh, allow really naive users to simply 
so suppose we have a subset of high quality, really tested workflows. We don't have that many of these yet. We have some for VGP, for example, we have some for COVID. We also have some great workflows in GTN world, which we can use for that. Uh, what we were thinking is that let's pick one workflow and see if we can make a prototype of the interface where you basically choose a workflow, uh, drag files, click a button, and it just triggers this analysis and gives you outputs without, uh, without immersing you into any uh, complicated details. So this will only work for, uh, for um, really well curated workflows. It will only work in the cases where we, well, at least user can guarantee that the data is good. But um, there is, there is, there are a few user cases where this would help us to bring people in Galaxy without giving them kind of a extended lectures on how to use it. Once they see how this works, I'm sure they will, um, they will want to learn how to create workflows themselves and how to use Galaxy in complicated ways. But maybe for some workflows, we want to try to do that. I don't know if it's possible in this cycle, but but we can talk about this in the in the UI UX group. And personally, my priority for the next, uh, I don't know if it's possible before GCC, but I'll try is to write a paper on, on new UI features. And the, by new, I mean the past six years, maybe. Uh, we have never published, for example, collections. We have never published any logic behind um, rule builder. And this all needs to be popularized because I frankly don't know any other uh, sort of a GUI driven platforms that allow as much flexibility as we do. So are we missing anything from the UI UX? And also I would like to ask, you know, if anybody wants to speak up people who are not directly involved in the working groups, perhaps the community at large, are, we, are, there, are there things that, are not here, but are really critical. Well, looks like we're doing a great job in capturing everything we need. Okay, well, that's, um, that's, I was talking about UI for five, five minutes. It doesn't do its justice, UI has, uh, went through fan, just fabulous transformation. And so let's keep on it. Bjorn, explain the backend. <laughs> Can you scroll down a bit? Okay. Um, yeah, so similar what Anton said. So it's, it's, it's very impressive to see what we did in the last six months especially with all the underlying infrastructure work that also, I guess, enabled a lot of um, um, what the UX um, working group has then um, taken over and enabled them. Um, and we would like to encourage to do that um, also in the next period. So um, work on the underlying infrastructure, uh, moving the fast, fast API port forward, um, we think that addressing the limitation of the task framework has a high priority since we need to get that probably deployed on org because there are many, many features that kind of depend on the task execution framework now. Um, and if we want to have users on org um, and AU also using that, um, I guess we need to streamline that um, and, and identify and fix the, the missing things to deploy salary or whatever task execution framework we want to use. Um, and, with, and the same goes then for SQL Alchemy and, and the fast API work, um, especially for workflow APIs um, that might be interesting and, and was requested also um, then by the workflow working group, et, um, et cetera. So um, yeah, I, I think, the, the progress was is just tremendous um and it feels from i mean from the outset it feels that we really accelerating um 
in our development and, and the features that we're adding. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot um, for that and feel encouraged to do that in the next months as well. The other thing that we identified and the, that we hope that the backend team um, working group can help us is we, we have a real, um, yeah, um, um, a capacity problem with, with admins currently and deploying and keeping our infrastructure up and running. I mean, th that's already, I mean, <laughs> we have this problem since many years, but it, it, it got um, more emerging. Um, I think, um, because of things happening. And um, one thing to address a capacity problem is either to educate more admins and hire more admins. And, and we are trying to do that currently. We will run a new admin workshop and so on. But the other thing is that we maybe um, try to lower the barrier to enter, right? And, and, and get rid of um, quirks that our admins are currently using to keep the system up and running, but that maybe should move into the back end or where, where we should just add better documentation. All of these stuff really help to build admin capacity. And, and we would like to ask the, the back end group to really assist the system working group um, even more. And we appreciate that you already did in the last cycle. But um, keep keep that up and going, um, please, and and help us um, fixing this capacity problem in the next um, months or years. Um, specifically, I mean, we have talked about that in other meetings. Um, the IDC, the the Intergalactic um, Data Commission for our reference data, um, the backend team has has done great work in the last cycle for that. Um, but we are still not there, so we, we need to get that done. I, I think it would be cool if we have that for GCC when we are in Australia. Um, they are still Pulsar hardening. Pulsar is for many deployments an integral part by now, especially for the Australians. So um, we, we consider this as an important piece of our infrastructure. And the other point is what we call these meta scheduling. Huh? So, we have agreed to use TPV um, that, that is developed by Nguyen um, and um, the Australian team so that we can converge um, against that um, system so that we can at least again building capacity in the sense of we share um, all the job definitions and the um, allocations of um, memory and CPUs and so on. Um, yeah. If you can help there, um, that would be phenomenal. Also with the new tool shed, um, we are pretty excited and, and um, we would like to get that deployed. But I guess we need to have um, backend help um, or the backend team helping the this, um, system team to do that. Um, yeah, and then streamlining this um, thing. Um, Andon, can you go up a bit? <laughs> Thanks. The next um, big item um, is a user-based object stores. Um, um, yeah, we have that since um, many uh, cycles on the um, roadmap. There are two very promising pull requests by the backend group that, that are uh, close to be merged. That goes a long way into this direction of having the user-based object store. Um, and we think that should be a priority of the backend working group um, for the next cycle as well to also enable then something like the the scratch histories that Anton talked about, um, where hopefully the 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 front end and working group um, yeah can pick it up and and um, design and implement a nice user interface on top of that. Um, federated data local computing um, on commercial clouds um, is requested by a few brands. Um, yeah, so that is also on the to-do list um, for the next cycle. I think um, Jeremy will, will talk about that later a bit. Um, yeah, and the merge and hardening of the toolshed replacement, so we can finally tick that box off. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, we, we really look forward to this um, work. 
and, and also then learn more about that as we go. Last but not least, um, we had the question kind of what is actually needed to label ITs as stable so that we can actually distribute them with the tool shed. So what is missing? Um, how can, I mean, can we fix that so that we can also make um, a very nice and, and close story about ITs, how we distribute them, um, how we advertise them. Um, and with the new work of the front end working group that we see also with ITs, I think that's an, a very nice story. Um, and if we can close it by finally labeling, the, labeling them as stable, um, yeah, that, that would be nice. And it would at least be nice to know what is missing um, and, and how much time that would take to, to close that off. Yeah, I mean, with that, um, all what I can say is it's, it's really impressive. Um, I would really like to understand what happened in the last year that we accelerated so much, added so much new features. Um, particular with all these, maybe the work that are not put into features like the fast API work that enables now um, and TypeScript generated clients and so on. Um, we would encourage you to talk about that more or maybe write a blog post about that more. I think these are important milestones that we have reached and that we should really communicate to a broader community. Um, and you can all be very proud of that. Yeah, is there anything else from you that you would like to add to the backend working group roadmap from the community side? Any questions? Nothing. Okay. People will be able to do PRs against hub page if they will want to add something. Of course. Um, can you scroll down a bit? Yeah. Should I do testing and hardening as well or? Yes. Um, yeah, testing and hardening. So the working group. Um, um, so what, what we have seen is, is or, or let's put it that way, the, the release testing and the support that you give to the community, I think is very, very valuable. And um, I mean, follow from the outside the release testing procedure and talking to a few people um, that have been in these groups. Um, is I think a, a big success. So um, it's good that we have this release testing. It's also, I think, very good how it's organized um, and it brings the project further. So we, we really encourage you to, to, do, to continue with that um, and to support other working groups in adding more tests and better tests. So I think that's a crucial part and probably also a crucial part that takes us a, um, a little bit further than, than other projects and um, that we have so much testing. Um, what we would like to see maybe is, is really expanding testing tutorials a bit more um, so that new contributors have it easier to understand it, right? But we also appreciate that there's a lot of different testing frameworks currently that makes it hard. But I think as, I mean, Maybe we drop some over time, right? And then we should really um, keep the, um, the tutorials updated and make the onboarding procedure to write tests easier. Um, but just seeing outside contributions, right? From really community member that actually adds cool tests is, 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 is really encouraging. Um, and the same goes for ongoing work and testing infrastructure. So please keep that going. Um, testing is and, and will be um, important for the project. Um, and I think the rest is actually from your slides. So, um, and, and yeah, we, we like it. Um, the same as for the backend group, please talk and write more about the testing efforts in Galaxy, right? This is also a hidden treasure um, 
where we should talk more about that um, because there is a lot of work going into this and um, it should be appreciated and it should be also um, put into an, our outreach efforts. Yeah, thanks a lot, testing and hardening group. Any things to add? Okay, next one. Okay, <clears throat> tools and workflows. So in the past, well, it's probably already more than a year, uh, there was uh, one effort uh, to which I was paying particular attention, that's VGP. It's, it's interesting because it's uh, kind of a mega workflow project. It's, um, it's a situation where you cannot have one workflow. You have to have multiple workflows because uh, you know you start with some workflows depending on what kind of input data you have. You also you parameterize subsequent workflows from the, for example, QC matrix, which some of the workflows generate and so on. So it's a very complicated thing. Uh, and it raised a lot of issues, which I think workflow group is addressing head on. And one of these issues was sub workflow maintenance, because for example, in this case, again, going back to EGP, it's 10 workflows. Uh, they they kind of exist in five different groups and many workflows within each group, each group sometimes have two, three workflows. They all have common pieces. And all these common pieces are packaged as sub workflows, but when you're actually doing the polishing development and debugging of this, you are kind of not sure if you change here, what happens there and how it's all linked together. So the simplifying workflow maintenance will go a very long way because I think we will be able to simplify a lot of things dramatically. It's just, it's not always clear. Um, how the different snapshots, the versions of workflows propagate, but I think all these points address that. So this is very important. I think this would uh, this would grow significantly audience of people who will take advantage of that. So in terms of a second execution of workflows and tool tests, so does that, that's probably a question directly to Marius, does that relate to the, um, the, the fact that we cannot test workflows that, unavoidably have large test data sets? Um, yes, uh, but I think it's like, yeah, multiple multiple different things we can address with this. Um, I do. Breaking up. Think though that actually we can generate. Yeah, write it in. Because this is again, I think VGP raised that issue that uh, we want these workflows to be in all the main repositories. I mean, DocStore and the Workflow Hub, we want them to be up to the IWC standard, which is actually a high bar, but <laughs> just the nature of assembly is such that you cannot have small test data sets. So some of the tests, even if they don't make any sense, even if they just check the tools work, still require substantial compute. And that kind of complicates life of, of, of a workflow developers because they want to satisfy IWC, but they not always, um, it's not always uh, possible. I guess Marius is typing that it's possible to generate small test data for a <laughs> Let's talk about that <laughs> offline, yeah. Um, so again, it's interesting that the um, uh, the uh, job caching framework. So we have an interesting situation, which is happening on EU at this point. It will probably be happening on Oregon and Australian instances soon. So there are people, and uh, we love these people, obviously, who are crazy enough to do training sessions for assembly. Uh, I mean, I'm sure most of the people on this call understand what assembly is, but there is a workshop that is going on on EU right now where they're assembling, well, essentially human size. Well, it's not quite human size. It's about half of the human side, but it's a, it's a large vertebrate genome. And they're doing this in a class with multiple people doing it. Uh, so far, the interesting 
And the result of that is that we don't see any complaints. I think Bjorn is probably monitoring what's happening and but it looks like it's working, but it would work probably so much better if we had job caching enabled because basically all these people download the same stuff, they generate the same intermediate data sets and they're very large. And so that would also, that's, that's, a, that's key. Um, in terms of JavaScript expressions, I actually, I'm really curious to see how this would look like, but that obviously will simplify life for workflow developers because they will be able to do things by typing rather than connecting. And um, actually, I don't know what IWC thinks about the um, website for I IWC workflow. Are you guys thinking of some kind of an automated way of generating? I don't know, using the maybe bioconductor uh, version, of bioconductor lingo, how do they call that snippets or there is a word that they use. But what's, I actually want to ask IWC, how do you see that website development? Uh, actually, Marius might be having a case of bad internet right now, because right now we're doing this manually, but we, again, we have some uh, wonderful workflows and we want to make sure that we can generate colorful you know, documentation pages, which are maintainable. <laughs> because so far I was doing this thing of writing it myself. Uh, I like doing this, but it's ultimately unmaintainable. And in the year, it doesn't make any sense. And I would like to uh, have a better way of doing that. Yes, vignette, exactly. Thank you, Jen. Um, yeah, the workflow development, these are all obvious things if you, uh, if you if you develop workflows with the editor, you, you you know them and versioning included. In terms of high importance tools and workflows, I don't know if that's the sort of a final list. I think it should be. I think the real approach here should be sourcing community and also uh, going through GTN picking workflows from there and making them into production because GTN is full of great, 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 uh, great workflows. I don't know if all of them can be used in, in, in production, but probably with minimal modification. Um, so the standalone graph view, it also relates to number five website for IWC workflows. It would be nice to put it there as well. Um, so yeah, everything else is more or less verbatim from IWC slides, but what I want to emphasize here is that IWC is the newest working group. And uh, I mean, the workflows have become first a class citizens sort of a relatively recently in Galaxy in the sense, in, I mean, they've always been in Galaxy, but in the sense that we are now starting to push them as complete analysis solutions. So it's very important to our growth because in addition to all the functionality, in the end, uh, people need to understand that you can do these complex things with Galaxy and there are stable version curated workflows that allow you to do that. So any other comments on workflows? In particular from People who are normally outside of our meetings. Um, yes, if you if you're shy enough, you can always do PRs. But okay, systems. Bjorn, you want to go over that, or do you want me to do it? I can, if no one else wants. Yeah, as I said, um, we have a capacity problem um, with our admins. Um, I know, can you go a little bit up? Sorry. <laughs> um, but but nevertheless, um, I mean, our the, the first and primary goal is to keep the, the big instances up and running and to support our community to to spin up more galaxy instances national wide institutional wide and so on so um that's that's 
for sure. But for example, um, the systems working group, I mean, as Anton said, the workflows were important. And um, one strategic goal is to get these VGP workflows um, at least on the three big um, Galaxy instances. And we know more, and we know that, that um, a few national instances are also interested in. So um, deploying that and um, sharing again the, the resource allocations um, that we figure out as we go is, is one important um, milestone. Um, the other one for um, org is um, to hardening and, and the deployment of the iROAD server. Um, and hopefully, I mean, with the next release then in summer, it gets also easier to test that um, with the um, object store work that is pending um, and will be merged. Um, yeah, and the other thing is that the systems working group um, will or should collect um, all these um, pain points or hacks or however you want to call that. So the workarounds that we keep around um, for certain things that can be improved in Galaxy. And I think we should make such a list, convert them into issues, and, and really prioritize that um, so that over time, the systems working group needs to yeah, streamline, can streamline their deployments, and with that, um, yeah, gain capacity. Um, potential candidates for that is, for example, um, the toolbox handling currently, which is a little bit um, still a little bit awkward, I think. Data managers that that um, loops back to I, IDC, um, but also better error reporting um, might be very helpful for admins and also the um, support persons. Um, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, handling of reference data that, that also goes back to IDC. Um, in the slides, we actually had this nice um, figure, um, I think, from Nate. Um, we have more or less just very little downtime these days. Um, and I think that that speaks for the project as a whole, right? Both the backend systems working group, but the entire team that the services that we actually create and actually run on our infrastructure are, are more stable than ever, I would say, with more users than ever. So that's actually, I think, um, a, a very good thing. And um, Systems Ruben Group, thanks a lot for that. And um, I think that image is, 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 is very telling for our community, right? And our services that we provide. Um, and we appreciate all the effort that goes in, <clears throat> but we also recognize that there is um, yeah, a capacity problem and, and we would like to, to fix that. Um, and yeah, that's what we will work on as, as a Galaxy board um, as much as we can. Questions or anything that we forgot for the systems working group, anything that we should add that is priority, what you think should be added? I know one thing we should probably have on the roadmap is to actual steps for what it would take to bring the three big instances in complete sync. So that sort of red bar here about the US problem is that we, so we frequently lack in um, having the latest versions of tools, which are already in uh, IUC. So I personally would like to just have a carbon copy of EU toolkit, ensuring that the versions are synced as well. I, I don't completely understand what keeps us away from that, probably Nate's question. It's a... Uh, it's a rhetorical question, Nate. You don't have to answer now. We'll talk about it later. Uh, there's a question. Yeah, uh, yes. Carol from, from Canada, from Quebec. Yes. I'm, I'm new to your meetings. So, uh, welcome. Very, very informative. Uh, like Bjorn, like I exchanged by email with, with Bjorn. So, uh, uh, I, I was curious like uh, about the resources. Actually, you mentioned the li you have li limits in resources. I don't. So what's what do, what kind of resources do you have uh, on each of the use uh, 
they use Galaxy, like the dot org, like what kind of cluster do you have in back? So, so as like for the audience here, we uh, I jumped in in the in the program. Like I was in GenApp, and we were instant uh, having uh, several instances of of GenApp of a uh, Galaxy within our infrastructure in Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you, you probably know, David Moret, uh, which uh, which was with us, but he left uh, a couple of months ago, and I. Uh, I was leading the Gen app as a whole, but now we're moving the project to have you know, on the long term a use Galaxy like like another public server. But I need to make a case. <laughs> I need I need to make a case, and I would probably bug you with some 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 stats there. But one one information I I, I would I need is like what kind of resource do you have in in the back? You see, you're lacking some some uh, some resources there, but what it, what is it like? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> the three instances obviously have different resources. So in US, mm -hmm. we rely on um, on infrastructure which was <clears throat> provided with something that was called Exceed before. It's a national NSF funded network of supercomputing center. But most of our compute comes from uh, Texas Advanced Supercomputing Center. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also use, for example, Jetstream Cloud, which is split between Tech and Indiana, uh, and in 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 EU it's different. It's the German Bioinformatics Network plus there are European country specific uh, compute centers, and in Australia it's they have their separate scientific cloud. So, so but in essence, it's all public. Uh, it's all publicly funded clouds that mm -hmm. we use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you're asking from the standpoint is that's enough to serve Canadian users, then the answer is yes. Uh, oh, well, more. I was more curious about what's the size of these resources. So we sure. we we are going to have like an allocation for our projects, mm -hmm. and like for the first phase. So uh, uh, actually, we're we are, we're waiting news for that. So, but I'm I'm curious to see the size. Like what what's the 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 figure of the, the like when you have a, a, a use galaxy running, uh, what kind of size are we looking at? Uh, uh, well, there is this nudely figure from uh, Nate, the main sysadmin of the .org, which we can send you. It kind of explains all the resources. I'll do this after the call. Oh yeah, yeah, good. But it's very nice meeting you. So we're not that far. Are you located in, you're in Quebec or in Ontario? I'm in uh, Quebec. In Sherbrooke. So that's great. So it's, it's a chance to practice Quebecois. So perhaps oh, we'll have it. Uh, <laughs> that would be fantastic. Uh, so let's, um, I'll, I'll email you after the call. So I mean, that's, that's just because we're in the same time zone. So it's easy to ask questions, but I can, I can provide you with enumeration of what we have. Okay, good. Thank you. So great. Thank you for asking. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, so goats, <laughs> um, you know, the this is, uh, it's one of the most critical things to the functioning of the entire project. Uh, and so there are, it's, uh, it's a great success story because, you know, for example, GTN is a poster child. I mean, I think every time, uh, every time you want to highlight Galaxy, you point people to GTN. And one of the problems with GTN right now is that we need to seriously think about next uh, funding period. And because this is uh, kind of a geographically, so GTN, the people who lead GTN are actually in Europe. Uh, this is Sasuke and Helena, so we need to think about um, how to help them to obtain that funding, but we can, so we're, we're thinking about this. It's also part of the exercise that our executive board is, is, is doing right now. Um, so, yes, <laughs> keeping GTN, keeping our user support, I mean, obviously people like Jen, who does support for the, for the dot, dot .org is under immense load, and same thing for EU, same thing for, uh, for, for Australia. 
Uh, and it's not necessarily only God's goal to, uh, to grow the galaxy event horizon. It's in general, we need to go to more conferences and we need to go to conferences where we outside of our comfort zone. Uh, for example, in the US, there's, there's a number of microbiology conferences. Galaxy has some spectacular tools, tutorials, GTN tutorials and, and workflows for doing very different kinds of microbial, you know, anything from wastewater monitoring to, uh, you know, variant calling in, in all sorts of viruses. But I don't think these audiences know. And it requires a sustained effort because when you go to a new conference first time, you never get, you know, maybe you'll get a poster, maybe you won't. So that requires sustained effort. We need to identify people who can do that and help them go to these conferences. And that's, we should really improve that in the next year. Um, any comments about, uh, yes, and at least on the, on the US side, hopefully we'll have a new communication specialist, which would increase our uh, activity in informing people. I think you and AU are doing a great job already in that domain. So um, if um, anything else, anything I'm forgetting about GTM, but at least from my standpoint, funding is, uh, uh, goats, uh, funding GTN is, is for me is a top priority. Okay, um, so next we have two things which are very important for branching galaxy into, um, into human data and in, in cancer uh, genomics as well. So Jeremy, would you like to start with I, uh, ITCR? It's misspelled here. Yeah, I'd be happy to Anton. So as Anton noted, and maybe I can try to make this clear that both what Ennis is going to talk about next in terms of human genetics and ANVIL and ITCR and cancer applications are in some ways this bridge to new communities. Think of us as power users potentially, so analogous to BGP or something like that, where we have scientific goals, and I'll share some of those. And then based on those scientific goals, we have things that Galaxy could do better that would enable us to achieve these goals. And I view these as synergistic because the goals drive the Galaxy development and when the Galaxy development happens and we can use them to accomplish our goals or work towards our goals better in the cancer space in this instance, then it's a virtuous cycle and it's, it's really powerful. And that's how I present it when I talk to the cancer community. And I think it's a really nice story about why things like Galaxy are needed, which believe it or not, are not. Um, it, it's a discussion I constantly have with individuals about how much infrastructure you need and what type of infrastructure needs to be put in place to accomplish things. So scientifically, from a cancer perspective, the things that our group is pushing on, the things that our collaborators are pushing on, the things that I talk about when I talk about Galaxy in the cancer space are multimodal and spatial analyses of molecular data sets. So we're still talking about DNA and RNA and protein, not so much about anatomical imaging, such as MRIs or CT scans or something like that right now. But these molecular data sets increasingly have a spatial component too. And you saw some individuals from our group share some of this at the last GCC, and I think I have a slot in an upcoming Galaxy community call to go into this in more detail. So I'll show you some beautiful pictures that we have of single cell data, where you can see tumor cells right next to immune cells, for instance. But we want to be able to process all of this quantitatively. So that's our goal. Sometimes these are simple workflows, sometimes these are complex workflows. Machine learning is a big part of cancer data analyses at this point. The ability to connect what we're seeing at the molecular level back to the patient level is really important. And two really simple examples I can give you of things that we've done over the past couple of months is we've used RNA-seq data to predict response to therapy. So you get a uh, patient's tumor RNA-seq data or gene expression data. And you say, will this patient respond to this therapy or not? And we build a machine learning model for each of the drugs that we have available to us and we try to identify the drug that's most likely uh, to be effective. 
And a second example is a little more technical, but it's still really important. Oftentimes, when you look at a tumor from a molecular perspective, you care about how quickly it's proliferating or growing, because that tells you a lot about how aggressively you have to treat a patient. And to do that, you can actually get down to the level of individual cells now and say, is this cell proliferating or not based on a protein marker? And we can use machine learning to look at the image of that cell and say yes or no. And then finally, Anton hinted at this before, uh, the idea of trying to analyze these large cancer data sets, which are oftentimes located on these commercial clouds, because that's where the National Cancer Institute is asking everyone to put their cancer data. And you can't easily take the data off these clouds for two reasons. Number one is it's gigantic and it would be really expensive and time consuming to try to take these terabytes of data and move it off. But secondly, oftentimes it's protected as well which means you've got to be able to analyze it on the cloud because it's not authorized to be moved off the cloud. So with those scientific goals in mind, I'd say that over the next 12 months, 2023 here, that these are the things that if we were able to make advances in Galaxy would make the most impact in the cancer space. Bjorn um, and Gal uh, sorry, Bjorn and Anton talked a little bit about this along the way, the idea of simpler user interfaces and activities. Galaxy is a fantastic tool. Everyone is excited when I first talked to them about it, but it's hard sometimes to pull them in and say, here's how you run a tool in 30 seconds or a minute, rather than here, sit down with this tutorial. And then after you run this tutorial, then you can start to run tools. So a simplified user interface, the concept of activities and quickly guiding people to a workflow that they can run in a couple of quicks by dragging their data into their web browser would be fantastic. We use a lot of tabular data in Galaxy, and Galaxy's support for tabular data is challenging at times, especially with a large number of columns, and especially when you want to edit that text a little bit. Um, so I, I guess I would make, this is more, I think, smaller improvements that could be bitten off um, pretty easily, but the idea of better tabular data set support, I'm happy to share some concrete examples where we struggle. Oftentimes, it's a large number of columns that we struggle with. But the inline text editing is huge, to be honest. The ability to change a couple small things in a file, whether it's the name of a column or add a header or something like that would be really valuable. And I know we can do this with a text editing visualization, but it's not the most intuitive to get to that place and then get back. So just some small cosmetic fixes would go a long ways to working better with tabular data sets in Galaxy. Bigger asks, um, data local processing. So I, I hinted at this before, the idea that if you sit on usegalaxy.org, for instance, that we can run analyses on AWS and GCP, and that data stays on AWS and GCP all the way through. If I understand correctly, what this requires is setting up a Pulsar client on one of these commercial clouds and somehow tackling the billing questions that come along with it, and then user-based object storage so that you can put everything back in the cloud rather than having it route back to usegalaxy.org, for instance. We're working on, and we certainly would love to work with the community on simpler machine learning tool suites. Um, we have some ideas here. We talked a little bit about Ludwig. I'm still really excited about this in particular, where you can write some small YAML files to create really complex machine learning models. And building up a model repository is really important in Galaxy as well, so people don't have to start from scratch. It's totally analogous to workflows in that sense, where you have this component that you could use maybe from a Galaxy data library that says, here, you want to analyze your image data. Here's a machine learning model that's available. And then workflows, examples, tutorials, this hooks directly into GTN that Anton talked so nicely about before, um, about a couple key aspects of challenging analyses that we're working on right now that would be really valuable to the cancer community. Multiplex tissue imaging, I think we have our first version of a GTN tutorial up now and published. And then several machine learning tools have, uh, tutorials have been published as well. So I think the latter two in particular are in our play. And maybe the first four, for instance, would potentially have interest for the Galaxy developer community. And we have just a couple of minutes left, so I should quickly say I'm happy to discuss offline, take questions, but let's turn it over to Ennis for human genetics and Envil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. So I'll, uh, I'll rush through this. So we are uh, respectful of uh, people's schedules, um, but it goes along the lines of what uh, Jeremy said that uh, the sort of view of Galaxy on Anvil is largely as a consumer of Galaxy as it comes. 
Um, it does try to you know, uh, make a case for galaxy in this uh, human genetic space. Um, so predominantly the ability to operate on protected and private data uh, to be used as a test platform and an integration platform for the uh, growing and popular uh, GA4 GH APIs um, and to support large scale analyses that people may not be able to do on public servers due to quotas. Um, and so some of the things that would sort of help us um, along the uh, accomplish those goals is to better analyze how Galaxy is used. Uh, so we did that through some initial passes at cost modeling, uh, because cost is a major concern for these users. Uh, running these queries on the large used Galaxy databases is uh, slow and, and time consuming, especially being done regularly. So having a read optimized copy of the used Galaxy database that gets updated every month or so would be uh, great to keep users up to, you know, up to date with most recent data. Um, all the tools on Anvil run in containers, um, which by containers is great, uh, but we do have substantial sort of failure rate on the automated test. Um, so seeing those be more consistent would, would help um, and then translating that to the end-to-end -end workflows. Uh, similar to what Jeremy said about being able to operate on data that originates in a bucket uh, and returns to a bucket without ever really uh, touching the shared or no need for a shared Galaxy file system um, would be great help uh, on how to set this up as Bjorn said. And we spent the last six months trying to get uh, some of the latest changes on Galaxy deployed on Anvil um, for a variety of reasons. And so some of these things while developed if they don't come with documentation is, is almost useless. Um, so this is looking at Further forward is optimizing startup. It still takes close to 10 minutes to get Galaxy on Anvil running. Uh, if we could have something that is instant, nobody wants to wait for 10 minutes, right? So if we had the ability to uh, just reduce the number of dependencies uh, as the current server client model works, or ultimately if we could serve the client in a static fashion where you get a, a semi-functional instance of Galaxy that then is backfilled um, as the server comes up would be, uh, would be great. Uh, and again, um, sort of continuing to play with the GA4, GH um, crowd uh, to support more of the APIs is that's one of those things that the NIH is uh, particularly pushing for strongly and, and working with uh, sort of other clouds you know, from cancer to uh, uh, lung and things like that. So anyway, we're out of time. So um, but yes. I, 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 would, I would say that we're already uh, doing pretty well, doing some job in implementing GA4GH, uh, G, I mean, GA4GH APIs. And I think we're probably one of the few people who are doing this. So it's, but yes, we need to do more. Okay, so um, I guess what we'll do, we'll sit on it for another week and then we'll push it to Hub and then please uh, submit PRs, complain, update, and ask questions. Um, it's, yeah, it's already one hour. So any other questions? Okay, well, if not, I really, really, really wanna thank all the working groups again. It's, it's been, after we established this, what, two years ago or three years ago, this, this, this has been, uh, great. So we are really, uh, we really appreciate what's happening. All right. If nothing else, then I will close that. And uh, there is a recording. So if you want to hear this again, you can. If not, see you at the next community uh, call in a few weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.